Help me understand how you're going to do a recall on whatever that is. Again, we'll say scopes. Okay. This specific scope model, you're telling me there's a recall. The predicate device listed should also be recalled then because that's what you're telling me, but you're not going to do that because typically that's a, an older device that's no longer on the market, right? Well, vice versa, but maybe it is on the market. So why aren't we pulling it then? And more importantly, why is that, we'll say, adverse event not being reported on that device? Public health. It's on everyone's mind these days from hand washing to emerging pathogens. Welcome to Transmission Control, an infection prevention podcast focused on your appetite for trailblazing thought, discussion, and innovations that will help you make informed decisions. Each episode, we speak with public health experts and safety champions from across the globe as they share their experiences, passion, and opinions. From investigative journalism to medical publications, we tackle real-world barriers to halting the spread of disease. Whether you are tuning in for education, inspiration, or to hear the stories that need to be told, thank you for joining us. And now, get ready to blast off with your weekly injection of insight on transmission control. This week, we are speaking with Jason Minutillo, Director of Quality for HLD and Sterilization at UC Health, and we're going to be talking about medical device design challenges, which has been discussed not only on this podcast previously, but also on some video shorts that Larry and I have started to put out on the Transmission Control Media LinkedIn page. Stay tuned for YouTube and other sources for those videos as well, but we've got the perspective of the end user today, Larry, somebody who has had a lot of engagement with the FDA, who does something very similar as you and investigates mod reports and is an expert on scopes and high level disinfection and sterilization, still very much involved on the front lines. And I think this is an incredibly important conversation to be had when it comes to infection prevention around the medical device design conversation. Right. So when people think of design of a medical device, they're thinking about the physical design of it. For example, with the biopsy port on a bronchoscope or the forcep mechanism on a duodenoscope and validation of the effectiveness of the device and that it can be reprocessed properly is crucial. But the other important thing we're going to talk about today is human factors and validation that the person reprocessing the scope can actually achieve each of the steps included in the IFU or the instructions for use. So we're going to be focusing today on human factors considerations, validation of the manufacturer's instructions for use, and get into a lot of user error issues as it applies to the MOD database, as well as a whole lot of other topics we're going to jump into and I'm going to ask Jason about. It's going to be a high energy and engaging conversation. Don't go anywhere. This is your chance to take a breath. We've got some information coming at you. Stay with us. I'm Justin Poulin. And I'm Dr. Lawrence Muscarella. From 17 Studios, let's get into it. This is Transmission Control. We are speaking with Jason Minutello, Director of Quality for HLD and Sterilization at UC Health. And Jason, you and I had a conversation on one of the other podcasts in the network, and we started talking about, not so much on that podcast, but after we got done recording, about what it's like to be an end user, especially when it comes to your perspectives on the way that medical devices are designed and the challenges that present to end users, especially the ones that aren't necessarily the end users clinically, but all of the other staff that play a role. Obviously, we'll be talking a lot about reprocessing today, but even the way that the industry is just set up and some of the competing expectations or guidelines that exist. So Jason, thanks so much for joining us. And I'm excited to have you and Larry get into a conversation because there was so much when you started, when you said adverse events and mod reports and FDA, I thought, oh, he's going to be great on the show with Larry. So welcome to the show. 
Well, thanks, Justin, and appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk with both of you guys. Like I said, it's it's definitely a passion of mine. I I constantly am going into the five ten k submittals, the mod events. I'm just I'm always picking those out, going where did that come from, and why aren't we reviewing these a little bit better, or frankly, more more review on the front end than the back end. Yeah. Do you have an example right now that we can start into, Jason, that is exactly what you're talking about? Absolutely. I mean, I, we'll go directly into an ERCP, the new disposable tip ERCP. How is it that, you know, it was immediately rushed to, to market? It's using a, a predicate device, the original TJQ, you know, whatever, whatever model you have, whether it's Pendex, Olympus, but you're using the predicate device to get it to market. And now you're starting to see those mod events creep up of the disposable tip being left in patients. It's not being covered that often, but it's funny how that's, you know, after effect. And of course, it's always user error. Uh, that's interesting. It can't be user error if you have that many occurring already, right? Right. You may be aware that Justin and I have done some, we've had the conversation we released today about the distal end cap. And while it was kind of like a Peter for Paul swap here, where we certainly reduced the number of infections with the fixed end cap duodenoscopes, the new end cap duodenoscopes, so I should say the end caps on the new duodenoscope models are prone to the two adverse events you're kind of indirectly referring to. Maybe you can talk a little bit about them. The first one would be the distal end cap falling off, maybe due to being improperly attached. And the second one is suctioning with the new distal end cap and maybe causing tissue to be drawn into that disposable end cap and causing tissue laceration. Do you have any experiences with either of those two adverse events as they were the ones that have arisen now once we've gotten rid of the fixed end cap design? So nothing specifically at our facilities has come across with that yet. But again, it's it's one of those things you're keeping an eye on it, right? And and I'm more concerned about from the reprocessing side of things of the distal end cap being affixed, not coming back out with the patient. Because now you're going in and you're having to grab that and have to do additional surgeries potentially. That's the part that I would say I'm most concerned with. But I, I actually was not not aware of the laceration piece, that's actually a little more concerning that just regular operations, if it's a fix correctly, you're still lacerating the, the common duct or whatever. That's crazy. Well, I think if it's a fixed or connected correctly per the manufacturer's instructions, we would think that these adverse events would not occur. But your point's well taken. Let's say they fall off and we're maybe under anesthesia. I think in bronchoscopy, this is more problematic. There is a balloon that's used for the ultrasound bronchoscopes that's falling off that can obstruct the lungs. But in the case of the GI tract here, we have to extend the procedure, maybe even perform an EGD following an ERCP, a second procedure, to identify this lost, if you will, distal end cap. Do you think the FDA has been active enough in notifying hospitals like yours of these adverse events and any other adverse events that you're thinking of? No, I would argue that, you know, it's kind of up to the end user. And that's kind of what we were talking about, me and Justin prior is, you know, it's up to the end user, i.e., you know, the frontline tech or maybe the manager or maybe an operations director to be aware of all of these different, you know, devices and all of the potential, you know, adverse events with these devices. And, and again, I don't know what the answer is, but you can't sit there and expect an, a frontline person to have that breadth of knowledge or more importantly, be able to get to the frontline person from the FDA kind of thing. So there's got to be a better methodology of communication. Yeah, I think when the FDA came out with those safety alerts recently recommending that hospitals first begin transitioning to the new duodenoscope models to now completing that, I think there was an opportunity missed that we've talked about in some of the other podcasts. So I won't dwell on it, but I think it might have served the public well for healthcare facilities to have been notified that, look, while reducing, we are certainly reducing the risk of disease transmission, we have these two other adverse events and there are mitigations for them. For example, confirming that the distal end cap, the disposable one, is correctly attached. And when you remove the duodenoscope, of course, certainly confirm that that distal end cap is still attached. And last, suctioning. Don't suction aggressively when that distal end cap of the duodenoscope is against the mucosa because you can draw the mucosa into the scope and then rip it as you're withdrawing the duodenoscope. Yeah. So again, I, I know that those, those communications, again, I personally haven't had, we haven't had any experience here at our facilities, but it's very interesting that again, I'm the one that's finding that out by going and doing that search actively on my end. I'm not hearing that information. 
And, and more to your point of, of, you know, the original discussion or the FDA recommendations, I, pr- I appreciate that they were putting out the recommendations, but they're basically telling the end user, Hey, give us your perspective on how to use the device, but we're going to tell you how to use the device. It, like, it's just a circular argument at that moment in time. Right. And so. Right. Well, can you give us some examples? And maybe it's the duanoscope or a similar device where the reprocessing instructions for use or IFUs you think might have been vague or particularly impossible to follow or even contradictory. And I may have some thoughts on that before I discuss them of mine. Could you share some of that with us? Absolutely. I mean, so I can give an example of, uh, you know, a spine set. I don't remember the specific company name, but they talk about in the IFUs, it says take apart, put into a, uh, a sonic bath and go ahead and while it's sonicating brush, that's not possible, at least in, in, in most SPD departments, because the sonic first off is, you know, closing and, and it's actually should be closed. So you don't have vapor occurring and everything else like that. But more importantly, you shouldn't put your hands in there. That's how you, you know, you're causing damage to your hands for a frontline tech. But who knows if that's actually read, if that's actually put into practice. I mean, again, are they doing that study in a laboratory setting or are they actually then taking that laboratory setting and applying it into the real world? I would argue they're not because of that example of an IFU. So that's, a, that's a very good example. And I think for those that are listening that are interested in the field of, des- of design control, I think we would call that a lacking verification. So for example, if you were reading the instructions and they were telling you to do something that wasn't safe or infeasible, you shouldn't be doing it. So you shouldn't be brushing the spine set while it's subjected to sonication. Your point's well taken. That should be checked during the review process and verified that the instruction is something that is safe and is feasible to do. So I think you have given a very good example there of something that maybe isn't impossible to follow or contradictory, but maybe is unsafe. That's something that we would like to think the FDA was involved in. Are you aware of the FDA being involved in that particular spine set case? Or are you aware of some other instances where there's similar instructions for use that you know the FDA was or wasn't involved in or should have been? Well, so I, I can't give, uh, I will say I can't give exact, uh, exact specifics, but overall a generalized feeling is, is the device is being done by the company. It's being put underneath a predicate device or it's maybe it's a new device being brought to market. It feels like from the end user is just the FDA is rubber stamping it because the company did their research. They submitted their, their IFUs into the 510k process. And that's as far as it goes. There's not additional we'll say discussion or verification of the process by the FDA. And frankly, I don't think they know what they would be looking for. You're giving a really good example indirectly, but I'll be explicit about it. So for example, if we look at, we talk about the recent ST91 guidelines, the FDA did participate in them. And while the FDA apparently approved of the ST91 reprocessing guideline, for example, reclassifying bronchoscopes as critical devices, the question then would be why is the FDA continuing to clear bronchoscopes as semi-critical devices for which it certainly recommends sterilization but doesn't require it and deems high-level disinfection or HLD permissible when sterilization is not feasible? Would you consider that maybe? Was was there some kind of a, using the metaphor of a rubber stamp? What do you think was going on there? Well, so with the FDA and the, and the and ST91, obviously, FDA being regulatory, ST91 being guideline, I think ST91 was trying to drive the ball to, hey, let's let's get it to not semi-critical and move it towards critical. And again, I think the FDA kind of rubber stamped it because they were in on those those guidelines and discussions. They didn't further they didn't they didn't challenge it i mean again i wasn't present for that rewrite or that review i've been in present in other ones where i've seen it go through and it's it's not challenged and so you know i I think if you're a a hospital or an entity that's going to use st91 as as your full-on practice and you're that's that's the the bare bones of it you're gonna get yourself into trouble but now you're relying on the fact that the FDA did not push back on that, right? I'll bring it to, you know, again, not to go into ERCPs, let's go into, you know, endoprobes, endocavity probes, transvaginal probes. Same concept is kind of occurring. Those probes are being more and more used in lumbar punctures, intravenous, uh, we'll say IV findings, so finding a vein. And those devices are only classified at the most semi-critical. And if you run it over an open wound or 
you know, getting exposure to CSF, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, you're supposed to do critical reprocessing of that probe. It can't be done. But the FDA rubber stamped that device to be only high level disinfected. Well, now it's got to be sterilized. How do you do that? So let's draw this clarification. This is a very important one that's very often overlooked. The semi critical versus the critical classification is generally understood to be completely as you just said. But let me add a little twist to it. If a semi-critical device is used in a critical way, in other words, if the intended use of the device, notwithstanding a semi-critical clearance, if the intended use is to contact sterile tissues or to uh, be introduced into the vasculature, even though it's a semi-critical device, the reprocessing instruction would have to be sterilization. And I know you agree with that. I'm not sure that everyone completely understands that. It's a really good point. But what do you do then if the instructions for use do not allow that instrument that was used in its intended use in a critical sterile setting? What do you do if its instructions for use do not permit sterilization? One would argue you cannot use it then for that in- for that specific intended use. Your thoughts? Yeah. I completely agree. Exactly that. And I I think that's where we're, you know, again, here's the end user, you know, an SPD tech, maybe a GI tech, maybe it's a uh, sonographer. They're not going to understand that because that's not what they've been trained to look for. They're not being trained to discuss that. And, and ultimately now we're leaving all kinds of variations on the table for the reprocessing. So I think, again, back to the discussion around FDA, you rubber stamp this by saying your predicate device says that it can be done this way, but you actually are going to be potentially using this device in additional manner. You know, I, I, we just actually had this conversation a couple of weeks ago with an ERCP and we want to do a lap assisted ERCP. Well, an ERCP can be sterilized, which means it needs to be either go, it has to go through ETO. Okay. That's the only way that based on the instructions for use, I've got doctors screaming that, well, we don't ever do that because we're going into a dirty part of the body. No, you aren't. You're going through a cavity and they're, they're, they're expanding the indications for use because they can do that. It, it just becomes an animal. And thank, and unfortunately, sometimes the, the, the low guy on the totem pole, the SPD tech, the GI tech, the sonographer are being bowled over and we're exposing patients. Yeah, and we want to focus on what that intended use is. That's what tells us whether we want to sterilize or high-level disinfect even more so than anything else. Justin, you wanted to talk a little bit as we're having this great conversation about maybe some of the themes that come up in terms of other issues involving design, or maybe we get into some discussions we're going to talk today about recalls and device approvals. Yeah, I want to. I definitely want to talk about recalls. And we've had a couple of conversations on various podcasts, but you and I, Larry, recently had one. We called it the Mod Pod. And so it ties very much into this conversation. And it also ties into exactly where Jason and I landed on bringing you, Jason, to this podcast was you felt like, why why are we getting all these recalls after device approval? Like, where are these pre-market controls? You know, we have the the predicate devices, and that allows, you know, devices to come to market a little bit quicker. But I'm sure if you have, well, I shouldn't say I'm sure you've seen the Bleeding Edge. If you're listening to the Beyond Clean podcast, I'm sure you've seen the Bleeding Edge. But maybe not necessarily, but on Netflix, there's this documentary called The Bleeding Edge. It does highlight some predicate devices and the process for predicate devices to get approved, even if there are adverse events and issues reported on the predicate device itself. And so you felt like there was a real crux with the way that that is, and also the way that devices are tested in a laboratory and getting approved versus what's actually practical in most healthcare environments out there in the real world. So do you, do you want to speak on those two elements? We can start with the predicate devices component, but obviously the the testing and, and more real world, you know, sort of pilot concepts. Yeah. So again, I, I, I think the FDA, because of the predicate device, we'll call it a loophole. It's not a loophole. I mean, that's just the process, right? But I feel it's a loophole because again, you're looking at a device that you know, we list a predicate device. I don't care what it is. Pick anything. I will, I, to make it to everyone's on the same page, we'll talk ERCP. You can't tell me that with all the technology and the new types of adhesives and the new types of plastics that are coming out, you can't tell me that we haven't been able to figure out how to sterilize this scope in a different manner. But we're not pushing that because we can use the predicate device. Well, 
that predicate device got so many people sick. So why do we keep using the predicate device as the, as the, we'll say the, the anchor to this, you know, process. And again, that's just an example of with that device, but I can give you a couple more of just devices listed as the predicate device. How is that appropriate? Especially when here, this, this will drive you bonkers. When we list a predicate device, but then that predicate device gets updated and we're still using the predicate device. How about that one? I see what you're saying, though. You're talking about the waterfall effect, right? And that it puts us into a little bit of a conundrum is that if the predicate device changes, does that mean that it should have an impact on any devices that were cleared or downstream due to that predicate downstream? That's a very interesting question to be asking about the impact of the predicate you know process and allowing predicates for the streamline approval through the FDA I'd I've never even thought about that Larry what's your take on that right what about this Jason what about a predicate device that gets recalled and even removed by the FDA from the market or by the manufacturer voluntarily and there are four five ten devices downstream that are based on that predicate device that hypothetically, let's say, was just recalled and removed from the market. Does that mean all those other devices will be removed from the market? I think certainly not. It's not feasible. In a theoretical sense, it seems to me that the predicate process would require them to be, because if you're substantially equivalent downstream to a device that upstream was removed from the market, well, then there presumably would be some problem with your device as well, unless I think you could show through some validated data that you were distinctly different and that the recall would not apply to you. But then if you were distinctly different, how could you be substantially equivalent to? Uh, so what are your thoughts on that, Jason? Man, uh, no, man uh, that was that was incredibly that was well put. Cause, <laughs> no, no, no. That's exactly what I what I have said. I, I mean, I have had conversations with FDA folks going, help me understand how you're going to do a recall on whatever that is. Again, we'll say scopes. Okay. This specific scope model, you're telling me there's a recall. The predicate device listed should also be recalled then because that's what you're telling me. But you're not going to do that because typically that's a, an older device that's no longer on the market, right? Well, vice versa. But maybe it is on the market. So why aren't we pulling it then? And more importantly, why is that, we'll say, adverse event not being reported on that device, right? That's the part that I go, I think we have a flaw in the system. There's there's issues around just, again, rubber stamping. Well, it was a predicate device. It's good to go. And and again, no fault to the FDA. I just don't know if they have the bandwidth to actually go through this process. So, Jason, what about a device that we go into the MOD database? That's the FDA's database that harbors all these adverse event reports. And we start finding a particular device that is repeatedly associated with, quote, unquote, user error. So the, the user keeps inadvertently using the device wrong, and then and the manufacturer's narrative continues to say user error. I've always been a believer that there is a real thing called user error, that certainly, we all know this, it's not really of a belief, it's a fact, that a device can be used improperly. And when it's used improperly, people can get hurt. And if those people are, are hurt, then what is the root cause? The root cause is that the practitioner used devi- the device incorrectly contrary to the instructions and therefore we declare it legitimately user error but there gets to a point where if one keeps using that is if the facility or the healthcare practitioner keeps using a device incorrectly or wrong the fda is going to step in and say hey hey maybe there's a design issue here that's facilitating user error maybe it's not just someone reading something wrong Can you comment a little bit on that on how we distinguish between whether user error really is a problem with the user or when it might be, hey, a a defect with the device? Well, so we'll go to the use, the end user reprocessing for that example, right? I, at least for my world. I mean, you can easily have a device. Again, we'll stick with the RCP because that's the easiest one. We're all common again. But, you know, here's the process. You know, again, the, the predicate device to the current one on the market. Oh, there was an issue with the elevator. There's a blind alley. It can't be cleaned, right? But initially it was all user error in terms of reprocessing. It was the staff didn't know how to reprocess it. The staff didn't know how to reprocess it. Well, one time, sure. Two times, eh, you know, it's, it's that old age, age old adage of, you know, shame on me for believing you the second time, right? So that's what kind of predicted the change. But I would argue you're still seeing that even now. Again, 
we're having issues around the, the tip. We're having issues or even with cleaning sometimes popping up and it's always user error. Well, it can't always be user error. <laughs> right. And that problem can be eliminated in theory it is by not just demonstrating the device is effective, but demonstrating through a validation of human factors such that the human factor validation shows that the IFUs, the instructions for use can be followed eloquently and effectively and repeatedly. And if the IFUs cannot be followed and staff cannot adhere to them, then we need to go back to the manufacturer and change the IFUs. So I think that's a very important point that if people are using the device incorrectly, it might be that the IFUs were not properly validated from a human factor standpoint. So, and that's where I, this is where I will play a little bit of devil's advocate. So that is actually listed in a lot of the 510Ks that are now submitted. Hey, did it go through the human factor reprocessing issue? Okay. My question is, is who's validating that they actually have checked that off in the sense of, again, not in a laboratory setting, in a real world setting. Again, Limpus is doing this process mostly in terms of their design inside, inside of their own laboratories. And then once they want to bring it to market, they're taking it to their, we'll say, quote unquote, super user hospitals and facilities. Well, during that time, they're providing all the additional resources. They're providing the text to come in. They're doing all the additional testing. Well, of course, the, the, that, that super user hospital is going to be minding their P's and Q's. Remove them out of the equation now. Are they doing the same process as before? And again, I would argue, I would hope yes, but have we validated that? Have we verified that? And that's where I come back to, great, you showed me that you're able to do that. I was actually teaching for CU Medicine their device design architecture engineering class. I got asked to teach on that. And it was hilarious because when I started pointing out just little nuances that those students were putting into their devices, they didn't know because they were just using what the predicate device was in the past or what some white paper that was, you know, kind of established for by their previous engineer to design a device. It never has been validated or put through the real world. So again, back to that human factor issue, is it being validated or verified? And we can do that in post-market surveillance, but maybe your question going full circle back to something you said earlier is, or maybe Justin said it too, is that the post-market is to be a fine check on pre-market. It is not to replace pre-market. So we get in a situation where devices are on the market unsafe. You, exactly. I, I, we, we, it's, it's amazing how fast we move in terms of post-market and how everything has to come to a screeching halt, pull this device off. Again, we'll go to the back to the ERCP 2015. The FDA was going to the end users and asking for recommendations on how to prevent that. That's not the end user's process. The end user shouldn't be telling the FDA what the company should be doing. The company should be telling the FDA what we should be doing and the FDA should be then telling the end user. And that's not what happened. And so that's why you were getting these really crazy, I mean, super, I mean, convoluted processes, including we'll say the scope culturing process. That's a whole other animal, right? Additionally, then you're doing double reprocessing. You're invalidating the IFU. And if you were had that written into your policies into a, as an end user, you had to go ahead and actually adjust your policies to make sure that you were not causing problems for yourself during surveys. So you're talking about the FDA's four supplemental measures that it published in 2015 to enhance the widening scope reprocessing. Did you have some insight for our listeners on that in terms of you referred to the four were culturing the endoscope microbiologically. The second one you referred to was performing high-level disinfection twice. And for completion, the third one was sterilization, of course. And then the fourth one was use of a liquid chemical sterilant processing system. Of those four, can you give our listeners any insight into how they might have compared to one another, which one you adopted, why you adopted as, as we start winding down this uh, very insightful conversation? Yeah, absolutely. So our system went ahead and adopted a dual high-level disinfection slash liquid chemical sterilization process. And we did that because that's what we had available. We didn't have ETO in our system at all, and we weren't planning on adopting that more so because of the the issues with EPA and, and, and bringing in and all that jazz. Okay, So that's how we went ahead and you know, move forward with those recommendations or those uh, supplemental recommendations from the FDA. But more so, we also started doing sculpt culturing. Well, our scope culturing was being done internally by our lab 
turns out that we were actually putting our lab at risk because our lab is a clinical lab, not an environmental lab. Not many people went ahead and created that differentiation, which caused all kinds of grief for people later on. Add, <laughs> add more to that layer. You have GI techs who are doing this process of scope culturing inside of a GI suite, which is not considered sterile. So now you're getting all kinds of, we'll say, funky results because you're getting all these environmental contaminants. It just opened up a whole can of worms. And again, it was because, well, we went to the end user. The end users are suggesting this. No, FDA, you're supposed to be the be all end all telling people based on the device manufacturer's guidance, what this is supposed to happen. And that's not how that went down. And so it now creates this massive, we'll say pile up. And now again, as I was telling you, we're not seeing the reports so much of contamination and certainly not of ERCP related outbreaks and infections, but we are seeing tissue tears, tissue lacerations, even the distal tip falling off of the ERCP scope of the new models in the airway, in the in the bite block and in the airways. So we have a number of complications that there are solutions for it. And and listeners can look at our, I guess, our two-minute video that we did, Justin, that we give specific recommendations about how to mitigate the risk associated with the new duodenoscope models and those two adverse events we talked about so we can move forward and improve quality. And that's always been our goal. And that's where we're heading now. Additionally, it's interesting, you know, we're, we're focused on ERCP. And again, we've really circled around that because that's what everyone kind of talks about. But, you know, now we're starting to see the creep up effect on colonoscopes and EGD scopes and bronchoscopes in terms of in, infectious agents me, being retained. Are we going to see the same thing happen with the FDA come back around and say, hey, bronchoscopes now have to be double high level disinfected, sterilized. So, but those devices can't be sterilized. It, it, we're going to see the same. I say, I, I, my fears, we're going to see the same response. And I would underscore gastroscopes. I think when my analysis of close to 15,000 MARD reports, I found gastroscopes as being associated with kind of an increased risk of exposing patients, at least of being contaminated and potentially exposing patients to multidrug resistant organisms. But we've not seen any alert. While we did see one, as you well know, for urological endoscopes, for bronchoscopes, and for duodenoscopes, we've not seen one for gastroscopes. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's exactly. You're, I, I've looked into the mod events, and I'm seeing that too. And I'm going, well, we're not seeing a, a you know a safety alert come out. Is that because we're not measuring that the same way, or is it not the high of a risk? Who determines that again? I, like I said, that's just it's it's mind bending in that regard because it's it seems like. We're going to have this, you know, suddenly come to the threshold. And again, I think the response is going to be similar to what we saw with those ERCPs because nobody's watching it. And so what do you recommend then the end users to get involved in this and how their voice can be heard? And what can they do to try to kind of for, for those of us that have batons, we can pass batons to others to help us. Do you have any thoughts on what can be done to make the public more aware of the concerns you and I are talking about in addition to you know, these types of podcasts with us, us talking about it? What else are your thoughts in terms of getting end users to support us and to work with us? Yeah. So I, I, I mean, truly it's a lot about, you know, again, the instructions for use, calling out those instructions for use. If you've got something that is way out of, you know, it's not feasible, it's not possible in your setting. It, I guarantee it's probably not, you know, feasible in another person's setting. So definitely, uh, informing the device company of, of those issues. But additionally, if, if it was an event that was causing harm, we definitely need to keep entering those into the mod system. You should be partnering with your supply chain group or whatever to be able to do that process, whether that's risk is another agency you can do that through. But you want to be entering those in and not be afraid to do that. We got to keep pushing those because again, the more those, the more data there is, I think that's what's going to change the, 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 again, the process for the FDA. It will, it will. And the more reports that we have, I mean, the concern would be during COVID that resources were limited at, and that when I look in the MORD report now, I find a lot of reports from overseas and fewer than I would have expected in the last year or two from within the United States. And I'm wondering if it's just because resources were redirected to more patient care issues than to kind of like MORD reports. And you and I know how important MORD reports are, but when you have a patient in a bed who needs immediate help, clearly that's more important. Has it, was that kind of your experience? I would agree with you on that. It's a little 
we'll say terrifying that because of the COVID pieces that we definitely needed to redirect to patient care. And I think that's what happened. And with that, I think infection prevention practices kind of slipped. Well, then that would explain the mortar reports. That might mean then there was a hiccup. And then in the next year or two, we're going to either get an onslaught of mortar reports or we'll just start seeing the types of mortar reports that we would expect to start creeping back in. Yep. Agreed. So, Jason, you just described spending a lot of time looking at mod reports, and I know that's something that Larry spends a good amount of time on as well, and it was an area I knew the two of you would find a great deal of commonality in. And by by this conversation, it's clear I was right. But the thing that you talked to me about was how some of these reports are categorized as user error. And when we talked about the real-world testing versus laboratory and not using post-market surveillance to replace pre-market controls and pre-market testing, this seemed to be the flag to you categorically that there are reports that get categorized as user error. And that's where I think you feel like there's a gap in this real world testing validation. And yes, you would still have to verify that your staff have the right competencies to execute it. But why isn't that part of a validation process that you know, 75% of the end users in the market can execute on these instructions for use and reprocess a device to the same level as in the lab, right, with some guidelines. So this user error, you said this really winds up pulling together a big question for you, which is, when does this become the manufacturer's responsibility? Or when does the FDA say this validation of, end user applicability <laughs> or sustainability when does when does or when should that come into play yeah so uh, justin what where my concern is when you see user error you can lump in a bunch of things underneath that right and when it comes to say devices that can be reprocessed is that the end user being the physician is that the user error of the reprocessor and it quite frankly, it feels like that's just a catch-all, right? And and so because of that, it's easy to go ahead and say, yep, user error, boom, yep, nope. And 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 what they're doing again is is based on what they did in the laboratory setting, not what's happening in their real world setting. And so Again, 75% of the time it can't be done, redone or reprocessed correctly for an end user in sterile processing. But somehow that's user error. That doesn't feel good, especially from a, a, an SPD tech or, who, again, is maybe entry level. They're not coming to work to purposely. Yeah, or somebody you know, working in the GI. You know, right. What if it's not centralized for sterile processing to be doing that? Nobody wants to feel like they did something wrong. And I exactly. think, you know, right now, when you look at workforce shortages and employee retention being at the forefront of healthcare's fiscal impact right now as a result of those shortages, Intrinsic value, competency, pride in the work that you're doing. I realize that this would be essentially a systemic issue, what you're describing, but it still has an impact on how people feel about their jobs and how they feel about how well they do their job. And we also know that the pay scale in sterile processing is such that a lot of times if a Lowe's or, a, or an Amazon warehouse center opens up in the same town, Sorry, folks, I'm out of here. And so, you know, we do want to solve for some of these issues because people feeling in conflict, you don't have to be a doctor to want to do no harm is really what I'm getting at. I couldn't have said it any better. And again, that's that was what came out from the SGNA and ASG groups when with the ERCP, we'll say recall or the, you know, when the FDA came out with their recommendations, you know, back in 2014, 2015. Oh, well, that it's it's the end user and not knowing how to reprocess. That didn't feel good. I'll be honest. I read that that position and it was a, a gut check because I don't think these people these people being the techs were coming in on purpose to do harm. They were coming in given the resources to do the reprocessing. And maybe that was not absolutely 100% correct in terms of the resources needed, but also additionally, it got put underneath user error. So it was their fault. That's not appropriate either. All right, Jason, you absolutely killed it. And I've, I've yet to hear somebody keep pace with Larry as well as you just did. <laughs> like that was a game of 
of you know scope ping pong intellectual ping pong that was really jimmy connor's i thoroughly enjoyed your I, that was i i you know it was amazing jimmy, jimmy connor's versus bjorn borg just the ball just cooked, cooked <laughs> back and forth <laughs> it Great was good job, jason thanks for coming on man absolutely i appreciate you guys again anytime anything and if you ever need anything from me as always i'm available that was Jason Minutillo, Director of Quality for HLD, that's High Level Disinfection and Sterilization at UC Health. And Larry, I meant it when we were wrapping up there. I've never heard anybody keep up with you like that. And it was really an engaging conversation. We covered, <laughs> I should say, the two of you covered an enormous amount of ground in 30 minutes. This is This is one of those episodes that people go back and listen to three or four times just to make sure they caught everything. And there are some real gaps in the industry that have just gone unaddressed. And, you know, I think sometimes people just have to pretend that those gaps don't exist, you know, because they've got to do what they've got to do to get through their day to day. But, you know, honestly, over time, we do need to look at some of this waterfall or downstream impact and 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 what are those implications because they do kind of just leave a lot of questions unanswered and and Jason brought really just an excellent perspective and an informed one from the front lines on something that you've been studying your whole career. Yeah, he has the really good clinical experience. And I think if the listeners Jason and I did talk about a lot. It was it was replete with uh, good information. But I think some listeners might detect something or might identify a, a topic intertwined in this in this linen, may find something that we missed, in which case they could email you or me, and then we could have a follow-up podcast where something that maybe we should have addressed or you know, putting a, a, some more ornaments on the Christmas tree, we could have another discussion about something we missed that you know someone in the audience is particularly sensitive to. So please, anyone, email me or Justin, and we will pick this up and continue this conversation. And uh, our goal is to answer any question that anyone might have. And so if we didn't answer your question, please contact us. Yeah, and you can also email info at transmissioncontrolmedia.com. I want to encourage everybody to connect with Larry and myself on LinkedIn. That's another great way to reach out to us. And you can also follow Transmission Control on LinkedIn. The best way to listen to the podcast episodes, though, is to download the smartphone app for iPhone or Android. Some episodes will have bonus content available just by going into the smartphone app. That's the only place you'll get bonus content. But if you're already listening to podcasts, which you very well may be, and you have them on Apple or Amazon, Google Podcasts, Podcast. We're there. You can also find us on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify. And honestly, there's just so many podcast apps out there. If you search for transmission control, you're going to find us. And I do want to just echo again that that feedback is important. Larry mentioned sending us, you know, an email if you think we missed something or there's a part two to this conversation that you think is really important, whether you want to be a guest and engage in that conversation or if you've got a recommendation for somebody, certainly connect with Larry and I, send us a message on LinkedIn, email us directly or just send an email to the show info at transmissioncontrolmedia.com on behalf of larry and myself thanks for listening to this week's episode of transmission control 